Welcome to Canaan Ministries, also known as Champions Church. Exodus chapter 28. From Exodus 25, you find the Lord showing Moses certain things on top of the mount. And he showed him the pattern of the tabernacle he was to build for him. He revealed it to him on the mountain. You find that in chapter 25. Then you find the Lord instructing Moses from chapter 28 as to who were to be his priests. He named them, and then in subsequent chapters, you find that the Lord was uh, I mean also instructed Moses as to how they were to serve him. He did not leave anything to them to imagine. He taught them through Moses how they were to serve him, the kind of animals they were to sacrifice, how the sacrifices were to be done. One in the morning, one in the evening. You find God telling Moses everything here. And again, he kept reminding Moses to stick to the pattern that he showed to him on the mountain. I said here the other day that God is a perfectionist. I said if you are a careless person, even though you may be a child of God, you don't resemble God in that area. God is not careless. If you study from Exodus 25, you will see the details that the Lord went into to instruct Moses as to the things that he was to do. The tabernacle he was to build, how it was to be built, the materials he was to use. The same thing with the Ark of Covenant. He told him the materials to use. He told him how to position everything. Uh, the different compartments of the Ark, etc., etc. They just revealed to you one major thing, that God is a perfectionist. I want to say it again, if you are a careless person, you don't resemble God in that area. Stop it from today. Ask God for the grace. It's better to do a few things in a day than to do 100 things in a day that you do not do well. It's better to do three things and you do them well than to do so many things that are not well done. Exodus 28 from verse 1. And take thou unto thee Aaron, thy brother, and his sons with him from among the children of Israel, that he may minister unto me in the priest's office, even Aaron, Nadab, and Abihu, Eleazar, and Ithamar, Aaron's sons. Thou shalt make holy garments for Aaron thy brother, for glory and for beauty. Thou shalt speak unto all that are wise-hearted, whom I have filled with the spirit of wisdom, that they may make Aaron's garments to consecrate him, that he may minister unto me in the priest's office. And these are the garments which they shall make a breastplate, an ephod, a robe, a bordered coat, 
a matter, a god. They shall make holy garments for Aaron thy brother and his sons that he may minister unto me in the priest's office. I started to share with us some time ago about the ministries of the Holy Spirit because nothing in the kingdom of God can be done apart from the Holy Spirit. I have said that you cannot serve God naturally. You cannot serve God in the flesh. For you to be able to effectively serve God, the Spirit of God must be involved in what you are doing. Any area of service unto God can only be effectively done by the Holy Spirit. I have made this one already. And then I went into sharing with us the different kinds of areas of service in the Bible. The major ones and the ones that are not so major. But every one of them requires the help of the Holy Spirit for you to be able to deliver effectively unto God and deliver effectively unto man. There is nothing God does that you can do naturally. A man may have a string of degrees in theology. In and of themselves, they do not qualify him to do the things of God. If God has called him over and above his degrees in theology, he must have the unction, the anointing of the Spirit of God upon him Otherwise, his products will be dead products. And I want this to sink home to us very well. Serving God is not just something that is to be taken for granted. In any area, we've looked into some of the areas. We've looked into the fivefold ministries. I read to us from Ephesians chapter 4, 11 to 13, the ministry of the apostles the ministry of the prophet, the ministry of the evangelist, the ministry of the pastor, the ministry of the teacher. And then I took us to Romans chapter 12 from verse 6, and we saw some other ministries there. The ministry of helps, the ministry of the exhorter, the ministry of church government. And I took time to elaborate on every one of these things so that it will be clear to us. But I want us to know there is nobody who is saved that is good for nothing in the things of God. If you are born again and you desire for God to use you, you must know your place in the walkings of the body of Christ. Paul was talking about the body and he used the physical body to teach about the spiritual body in 1 Corinthians 12. He said, the head cannot say to the feet, I have no need of you. He went into details. The head cannot say to the feet, I have no need of you. The head of the body is the Lord Jesus Christ. He will not say to the feet, the one that touches the ground, the one that is probably a new convert, he will not say to him, I have no need of you. Everyone that is saved is useful. If you are saved, find your place in the program of God. Occupy your office with dignity and with honor. Can somebody say amen? Don't be a dead weight in the body of Christ. Don't be a floating member of the body of Christ. Today, many brethren are satisfied to just come to church, worship the Lord, go through the motions, say the grace, and go home. That is not good enough. Every member of the body of Christ has a function. And if you don't know your function yet, you ought to know. You ought to know. 
Because your father in heaven, if you had asked him, would have signified your place to you. I don't want to, I don't have time to go into all those details. But if you don't know your place, you ought to know. For instance, if God calls you to occupy a place, he will give you grace to play that role. That's one of the ways you know. God does not put square pegs in round holes. If God wants, if he calls you to the ministry of the minstrel to lead the people of God in worship in his presence, the person who comes out here to sing is not just singing to man, he's singing to God. You are worshiping God, you are exalting God, you are glorifying him, and then you are carrying the people of God along. You are motivating them. You are galvanizing them in the spirit of worship to give worship to God in heaven. And if he calls you, for instance, into the place of a minstrel, he will give you the grace to play that role. You will find that you will have the voice. You will find that it will not be difficult for you to sing. You will find that that is a pool within you to function in that area. And then he will anoint you to function in that area. When he anoints you to function in that area, you begin to do the things you do with the power of the Holy Spirit. And as you give yourself to development, you find that you become more skillful in playing your role. David was very skillful in playing his role. So much so that when King Saul had a demonic problem, they called David to the palace. And he came and he took one of the instruments. And as he played it, the presence of God came down. And as the presence of God came down, Saul experienced deliverance. He says the evil spirit that was upon Saul left him. Because Demons cannot withstand the true anointing. The anointing, when the anointing is upon you, the presence of God comes down, as it were. The atmosphere is charged. And when the atmosphere is charged in the Holy Spirit, the devil is on their own. And as you minister in the anointing, you discover that the people you are ministering to, they will be receiving you will, be, you will be effective in ministering to them. Your songs, your, see, the wisdom of God will be working in you to choose your songs. You'll be choosing the right songs for the right occasions. And as you lead the people and they give the Lord worship, not only their minds will you touch, you will be touching their hearts. And as you are touching their hearts, change will be coming to them. Because the heart is the nucleus of our personality. If something touches your heart, it touches the rest of your being. So the person that carries the anointing, all of these things are upon him in the Holy Ghost and he can minister effectively the holy things of God. He may minister sometimes, people will break down and cry. The anointing does that. Somebody is convicted of his sin. He may minister sometime and somebody will be asking God that he may have more of his grace in their lives. He may minister sometimes, yokes will be broken in the lives of the people. Isaiah chapter 10 verse 27, it says, I come to pass in that day that I will take away the yoke from off their neck and I will take the burden from off thy shoulder. The yoke shall be broken by reason of the... So to stand and minister the holy things of God is not just to, I don't, know, I don't know what to call it. It's not just to come up and do something in the presence of people. When anybody stands here, he's standing before God, he's standing before his people. It's an awesome responsibility. And when you stand correctly and the spirit of God is upon you, it makes you an able minister of the gospel. In the name of Jesus, you will be an able minister of the gospel. 
to minister, called to minister the holy things of God. Before we go on, somebody read for me 1 Peter 4 verse 11. 1 Peter 4 verse 11. Amen. Thank you very much. If anybody speaks, the word of God says he should speak as the oracle of God. Now, for you to be able to speak as the oracle of God, God must be helping you. God must be helping you. You know what an oracle is. In our different villages, in our different towns, there are some oracles that are dedicated to certain divinities. And people go to those oracles to know what those divinities have to tell them. And the priests of those oracles stand there to minister the things of those demonic altars to the people who come. The same thing with God. Let, it says, if anybody ministers, let the ministers an oracle of God. You are not to stand there and be wondering what to say. No. You speak as the Lord gives you utterance. Acts 2.4, that's what it says. The Holy Ghost were on them and they all spake as the Spirit of God gave them utterance. So don't forget that. If you don't know your place yet, I expect that you will ask the Lord and he will confirm it to you. But where the Lord wants you to function in the body, he gives you grace for that area. That's one of the ways you know. The Bible says in Philippians chapter 2 verse 13. Somebody read it for me. It's not difficult to know. Philippians 2 13. Yes. Thank you very much. It is God that walketh in you, both to will and do of his good pleasure. So if God wants you to do something, he will walk it into you. That's how you know. Both to will and do of his good pleasure. You will deliver the goods, whatever area he wants you to function. Okay. So, we've gone through certain things that have to do with the anointing. I told you about measures. There are different measures. And if you have been listening, and I expect you to be listening, because this is a very important area of the ministry of the, of the church. I told you that the anointing is in different measures. It's in different measures. I quoted to you Matthew chapter 3 verse 11. John said when they asked him, he replied, said, somebody is coming after me. Whose shoes I'm not worthy to be here. He said when he comes, he will baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with power. But he also said in that verse that the one coming after, after him was mightier than himself. That was what John said. He said, one is coming after me who is mightier than I am. And I'm not worthy to bear his shoes. He said, when he comes, he will baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with power. Mightier. That's what John said. Ephesians chapter 4 verse 7. He says, unto every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. God measures out his gifts. We don't all have the gifts of God in the same measure. Ephesians 4, 7. Unto every one of us is given grace, but according to the measure of the gift of Christ. 
So different measures. I've told us about the peculiar anointing. I've told us about the team anointing. And I told us about the corporate anointing. And I said that is the anointing that's available when the people of God gather in spirit and in truth. Amen? That's the corporate anointing. And that's the biggest form of anointing that's available to the church on earth for now. No single Christian has by himself the corporate anointing. No. It's corporate, collective. Psalm 133 talks about that. Hebrews chapter 12 from verse 22 also talks about that. Okay. Things that enhance or hinder the anointing. I will share them with you today. Things that enhance or hinder the anointing. Psalm 45, verse 7. Psalm 45, verse 7. What does it say? Thank you very much. Thou lovest righteousness. He's talking about the Lord Jesus. Prophetically. Thou lovest righteousness. And hates wickedness. Or iniquity. Therefore God thy God has anointed thee with the oil of gladness. Above thy fellows. Things that enhance or hinder the anointing. Number one, you must know that the Holy Spirit is a Holy Spirit. You have to know that. That's why it's called the Holy Spirit. Of all names, it's called the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit of God is a Holy Spirit. So if you want to keep the anointing, the anointing, you want the anointing to abide on you, holiness must matter to you. Holiness must matter to you. The opposite of a Holy Spirit is an unclean spirit. And the Lord had occasions to cast out unclean spirits so many times from people. If you see what so many people do in the world today, you will know they are under the influence of unclean spirits. If you see what some people wear, you will know that they are under the influence of unclean spirits. In Mark chapter 5, one of the stories you find there is the story of the madman of Gadara and when this man saw Jesus he ran and worshipped him but the Bible says concerning that man that he was possessed of certain evil spirits and these evil spirits caused him to do certain things he says night and day he will be tearing himself He said nobody could hold him down. There was a kind of unnatural energy with which this man lived. Nobody could hold him down. Because of those demons that were inside of him. Another thing that he did was that he, 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 he put off his clothes. Virtually naked. Because after Jesus had cast out those demons, the Bible says he was clothed. And was in his right mind. So he was on cloth before. If you see things with the eye of the spirit. You will know that certain things that some people wear. Even though they may not know. They are, they are under the influence of demons. Unclean spirits. From the pit of hell. That are out to seduce. The 
that are out to do all kinds of things for their father the devil. But bless God, you are a child of the living God. You shouldn't have to be lectured on how to dress. If they have to teach you how to dress, shame on you as a believer. You are not a good Christian. Even if you were born, to, born again two weeks ago, if you are serious in your heart, you will know what you should wear. You will know. When we were reading in Exodus 28, God said concerning the garments of Aaron and his sons, he said they were for glory and beauty. Two things. That the garments of the priest were for glory and beauty. In other words, they must glorify God. I cannot even put on anything neither here. Neither can you because you also are a minister of God. He said the garments of Aaron were for glory and beauty. What you wear must be good to behold. As you cannot wear something that exposes your nakedness, so also you cannot wear something that is a disgrace and embarrassment to God. You cannot put on something that people say, why did you dress like this? We don't see his nakedness, but uh, dear Lord, he says the garments of the priest were for glory and any time, brother, that you want to put on something, the patterns are there. You know, you don't need anybody to be telling you, uh, be telling you this is how to dress, that's not how to dress. So we have seen in the place that my sister read for us that Psalm 45 verse 7 Thou lovest righteousness and hate wickedness therefore God thy God has anointed thee with the oil of gladness above thy fellow. The Holy Spirit is a Holy Spirit. Samson forgot that and it led to his fall. In the name of Jesus, you and I will not forget. And by his grace, we will not fall. The Holy Spirit is the Holy Spirit. Number two, the word of God. Acts chapter 20, verse 32. Acts chapter 20 and verse 32. Look at what it says. And now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you an inheritance among all them which are sanctified. I commend you to God and the word of his grace, which is able to build you up give you an inheritance among them that are sanctified. The word of God when it is properly meditated upon, it gives you a lift in the spirit. It builds you up. The word of God administers spiritual stamina to you. Hello? Sometimes you find that if you are given to meditation, sometimes as you are meditating, as you are meditating, meditating one of the things that will happen to you is that you are getting strengthened inside. That's your spirit man. Commend you to God and the word of his grace which is able to build you up. The word of God when properly meditated upon has the ability to build you up. Another word for that expression, build you up, is edify. The word of God edifies. It builds you up. It increases your anointing. The word of God fortifies you. Of course, the word of God also renews your mind. It does so many things. But one of the things it does is that it builds you up. Paul was praying for them. He said, I commend you to God and the word of his grace which is able to build you up. Praise the Lord forevermore. 
the more you also take in the word of God, it increases your intake of grace. He says, I commend you to God and the word of his grace. As you take in the word of God and meditate upon it, it increases God's grace upon your life. It increases your anointing in the Holy Spirit. So that's another way by which you increase in the anointing by the intake, meditating on his word. It is good to memorize the word of God, but it is better to meditate on the word of God. They are not the same. It is good to memorize it, but the expression you find commonest in the Bible is meditate. Thou shalt meditate on it day and night. Joshua chapter 1. When you meditate, you are not in a hurry. When you meditate, you are rolling it over in your heart. And it is as you are rolling it over that different dimensions of revelations are ministered to you by the Holy Spirit. But we're talking about the anointing. It builds you up. Number three, another habit that will increase your anointing is prayer from the heart. Prayer from the heart, it will increase your spiritual caliber. Look at Luke chapter 3, verses 21 and 22. Luke chapter 3, verses 21 and 22. Yeah, thank you. Yes. Thank you very much. Now, when all the people were baptized, so Jesus was not the first to be baptized that day. When all the people were baptized, it came to pass that Jesus also being baptized and and what? And praying. The heaven was hallelujah to God. He was not the first to be baptized. It says it came to pass as the people were baptized uh, and Jesus also was baptized. And prayer. If you learn to add prayer to your own things, your results will be different. Whatever you do, add prayers to it. And Jesus was baptized. And... Now notice, brothers and sisters, Jesus is the pattern. So when you see Jesus doing something, he's showing you, according to the heavenly pattern, how to do that thing. It's not, just, it's not just that he just did it for the sake of doing it. No. He showed you how to do it. Jesus has been baptized and praying. The heavens was open. In the name of Jesus, may you live your life under open heavens. Oh my Lord. Jesus has been baptized also and praying. Heavens open. And when the heavens open, it did not open to everybody. It opened to the one who was praying. It opened to Jesus alone. And the Bible says the Spirit of God came down in the form of a dove and it abode on the one that was praying. In the name of Jesus, you will get what others don't get. Yes. I pray at you. Your own. Prayer is not easy, but prayer is basic. Jesus being baptized, I'm praying. The heavens look for it. They open for everybody. They open for everybody. It opened only for him. The Spirit of God came down 
and abode upon him. And he heard the voice of the Father from heaven. This is my beloved son with whom I'm well pleased. In the name of Jesus, in your life, people will hear God. I want you to cultivate certain habits in your life. Power habits. One of your power habits has to be the habit of prayer. You pray when you feel, you pray when you don't feel like. You pray when you need something. You pray when you don't need something. Until prayer becomes a lifestyle to you. Are you listening to me? Let prayer become a lifestyle to you. But I'm talking about having prayer as your lifestyle. And I've shared with you before that prayer does not have to be long to be prayer. There are long prayers. There are short prayers. But if it comes from your heart, every prayer is important to God. And I remember the last time I was talking about this. I said, look at your food. I hope everybody here does that. You bless your food before you eat. Is that long? It's not long. But what the Bible says is that when you do that, you sanctify, that food is sanctified. And it's a very short prayer. Bow your heads. I mean, Father, thank you, Lord, for this meal. Bless it, Lord, in Jesus' name. Less than a minute, but the food is blessed. You don't know what prayer does. Prayer does not have to be long to be effective. There are long prayers. There are short prayers. But if it comes from your heart, it gets to go. I said it gets to go. Because I think the problem some people have is the thinking that all prayers have to be long. No. There are long prayers. There are short prayers. The kind of prayer you pray when you are in a VG, that's not the kind of prayer you should pray when you are in public. When we come together and say, Bro James, please. Bro James, round up the prayer for us. That is not the time for, for you to be saying, Oh, Father, we bless your name. But we thank you for what you are doing in Jerusalem. Your name will be glorified. Thank you, oh Lord. Boko Haram will be put to shame. No. If you are praying that kind of prayer, sit down. That's a good prayer, but the time is wrong. So when you are asked to round up prayers in a meeting like this, you should not, you do not go into all kinds of details. Some people were somewhere some years ago then they said, one brother should bless the food. <laughs> should bless the food. Say, Father, we are grateful to you. You are a merciful God. There is no one like you. Bless the food. So somebody said, why is he still praying? Please let us be eating our food. I'm telling you. I just don't want to call the name of the person. As an elder in the body of Christ. God has put elders so that to regulate our behavior. Bless the food. You are saying, thank you, Father, for this, for that, for that. He said, please, why is he praying? Can we be eating our food? And the Holy Spirit backed up that elder. What that guy did was wrong. Bless the food. I said, thank the Lord for this, for that, for that. No, no, no. Thank you, Father, Lord, for this provision. Bless it to your glory. In Jesus' name we... I just pray to bless the food. It should hardly be, be, be longer than that. But that brother was pronouncing, was going into something, and the elder intervened. That's, that's, that's one of the reasons God has put elders in the body. Sometimes a pro prophecy may be coming through somebody, but he does not know how to handle it very well. And he stands up and uh, uh, he just continues to go on and on. And I stand there. If I do like this, any serious Christian who knows how to handle such things will keep quiet. If I do like this, and the person is still prophesying, the next is to go and carry him. Because the Bible says, the spirits of the prophet are subject to the prophet. That's why the elders are there, so that there will be no confusion in the body. If you have the message, give it. And when an elder says, 
Amen. In Jesus' name we pray. It's okay. But if you hear somebody who continues to go on and on. I was in a meeting in Kaduna. I think it was 1985. 84, 85. And as the meeting was going on, somebody just raised his hand. He said, please, give me the microphone. Somebody was talking. He said, please, give me the microphone. I don't, want to, I don't want to die before my time. That was what he said. I was in that meeting. So they gave him the microphone. What do you want to say? Then he came forward. He said, uh, praise the Lord. He said, praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Then he said a few things that he felt the Lord was telling. But what he told us could have waited till the end of the meeting. He's telling us that he didn't want to die before his time. That was his own jara. The Spirit of God didn't have him to say that. You see, the Spirit of God is not impulsive. If the Spirit of God is moving in you, the Holy Ghost is a gentleman. He's not impulsive. It is satanic spirits that are impulsive. So you must go and do, go and do it. Say it. Say it. You've been in the Lord for some time. You know that there are third times the Spirit of God will be urging you to do something and you might not get up and do that. that time. Does God kill you? He doesn't kill you. You are his child. So somebody is coming like that brother and said, give me the microphone, give me the microphone. I don't want to die before my time. I will give him the microphone. And what he said, I can't even remember what he said now. It was something that he could have left to the end of the meeting. Before the sharing of, 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 uh, of the grace. But he came up and took the microphone. And it was clear that the spirit of God did not send him. Because if it is the spirit of God, you will be able to hold it. Maybe the Lord wants me to say this. Maybe somebody here needs it. If it is the spirit of God, you will be able to hold it. So prayer. It's another thing that will cause you to increase in the anointing. When you pray, aside from your needs being met, you are exercising your spirit. You are exercising your spirit man when you pray. It's one of those basic exercises of the spirit. And it will cause you to increase in the anointing. Number four. Another thing that will cause you to increase in the anointing, the right company. The right company. 1 Samuel 10, 5 and 6. 1 Samuel chapter 10. 1 Samuel 10, verses 5 and 6. And after that thou shalt come to the hill of God, where is the garrison of the Philistines? It shall come to pass, when thou art come tighter to the city, thou shalt meet a company of prophets coming down from the high place with a psaltery, a tablet, a pipe, a harp before them, and they shall prophesy. And the Spirit of the Lord God will come upon thee, and thou shalt prophesy with them, and shall be turned into another man. This was the instruction that Samuel gave to Saul. He said as he was going that day, he would meet a company of prophets coming down from the mount of God with, with sultries, timbers, harp, worshipping the Lord. And on through the functioning of the Holy Spirit, you find that there is a correlation between true worship and the manifestation of the prophetic. Samuel told him, because he didn't know, so he was going to say, you meet a company of prophets. He said, they'll be coming with the psaltery, with all kinds of instruments of music, and they will be praising God. And they will be prophesying. He said, when you get into their midst, you also will catch the spirit of prophecy. And you begin to prophesy. 
I said the right company, when you are in the right company, it affects the anointing. Praise the Lord. It affects the anointing. So you are in the right kind of company. The people there are of one mind. They are praising the Lord. It is easy for you to manifest the anointing like that because the atmosphere is right. The atmosphere is conducive for the Holy Spirit. Prophets will be coming from the Mount of God. He told Saul, he said, when you meet with them, you also will prophesy. Among prophets, prophecy will not be scanty. The spirit of prophecy will be in the air. And as you get into that spirit, you also will begin to prophesy. You have to be in the right company. Somebody says, for instance, if he says he's in the singing ministry, he has no time to be learning the songs. He has no time for rehearsals. When they are praying, he has no time. Well, the person is not serious yet. Because these things do not come by accident. They can be cultivated. If you are in the right kind of atmosphere, there are certain things you catch. And as Saul got to the met those prophets that day, and they were coming from the man of God, as the man of God said exactly that was what happened. Miss, immediately he mixed with them, them. He also started to prophesy, and they know this. He saw also a he saw also a prophet. And it was prophesied. So being in the right company is important in manifesting the anointing. Praise the Lord. Let me tell you another thing. If we are having a meeting, I'm not this COVID-19 kind of something, it's not very good. If we are having minister's conference here, I'm not going to allow somebody to sit in front who looks strange. If the person looks strange, I don't know him. I don't know who he is and he's looking very strange. He's not flowing with us. When we are singing the choruses, he's not singing. We are lifting up holy hands to God. He's not lifting up his hand. Rather, as we are lifting up holy hands to I will notify the ushers to please call him out and interact with him. Because I said something to them, there was no response. What am I trying to say? When you are in the right kind of environment, it helps the anointing. Praise the Lord forevermore. Let me give you another example. If you are in a place where people believe in your ministry, it will not be difficult for you to minister very well. Because the people you are ministering to, you know them, they know you. If they love you, they believe in your ministry. But if you are in a place where people don't believe in your ministry, but you just have to go there and do something, you will discover that if you are not careful, you will be nervous. Because you know the people you are talking to do not believe in your ministry. Company affects the anointing. Company affects the anointing. Another thing that affects the anointing is music. Second Kings chapter 3 verses 14 and 15. Read it for me because I'll soon be running off. Second Kings 3 14 and 15. Second Kings 3 14 and 15. Quickly. Yes. Give me a minstrel. Yes. As the minstrel played, the hand of the Lord came upon him. Thank you very much. When you hear the hand of the Lord in the Bible, quite often it's talking about the anointing. The hand of the Lord or the finger of God. The expressions that are used for the anointing in the Bible. This was Elisha, 
They wanted to know the man of God. And the man didn't know. Because nobody is always anointed. Praise the Lord. Nobody is always anointed. So he said, the way I'm feeling now, I can't tell you the mind of God. He said, please, can you get me a ministry? So the hurriedly and brought somebody anointed to sing the songs of Zion. That's the ministry. So as the guy came, <clears throat> and started to minister, the atmosphere changed. The Holy Spirit came upon the man of God and he gave them the word of the Lord. It says, as the minister proceeded to minister, the hand of the Lord came upon Elisha and he was able to say to them this is what the Lord is saying music there is anointing provoking music and there are some music that are that provoke demons hello so also this man of God Elisha when they came he was so to say dry but he said bring me a minstrel he knew how to handle it. When you are dry like that, go and fetch some anointing provoking songs. There are some songs, if I can hear them minister, I'll just begin to cry. When I begin to cry like that, it is a, an outward manifestation of something that is happening in my spirit. That's what happened to Elijah. As the minister was able to give them the mind of God. Music can cause the anointing to flow. And also, negative music can cause the anointing to dry up. So you, as a minister of God, you must be careful what kind of music you listen to. Praise the Lord forevermore. Finally, L-O-V-E, love. First Corinthians 12, 13, 14 are talking about the operations of the Spirit of God in the body. First Corinthians chapter 12. You will see the way it closes. It continues in chapter 13. And then in chapter 14, it's also still talking about the gifts of the Spirit. But chapter 13 is in the middle. The three chapters are talking about the offices and ministries and operations of the Holy Ghost. But chapter 13 is in the middle. And chapter 13, 1 Corinthians chapter 13, what is it about? It's about law. You know it now. And Paul said, if I speak in the tongues of men and I speak in the tongues of angels and I have no love, I've become a noisy gong and a clanging cymbal. So love is at the center of the operations of the Holy Ghost. If you want the Spirit of God to flow through you, you must learn to walk in love. I said you must learn to walk in love. Don't put hatred in your heart. If there's anything somebody has done to you, go to them and clear it off. Walk in love. The Spirit of God is able to use a Christian who knows how to walk in love. Ministries in the body, are all said by God. There is no big I. There is no little you in the body of Christ. There is no big ministry, small ministry in the body of Christ. It is the Spirit of God who determines how each ministry operates. So don't go out with a complex. Oh, that ministry is small. Oh, this ministry is big. No, everything of God is important. I said everything of God is important. Even if two people are evangelists, they may not operate the same way. One may be on television, the other will be showing film in villages. Both of them are evangelists. One is not big, one is not small. One is not important and the other one unimportant. It is human beings who say that. Two evangelists and they minister differently. One may be distributing tracts and is leading the people to Christ, showing things. The other man is on radio and is on TV. But of them are evangelists. So God wants us to flow in love. God wants us to operate in love. Don't let anything stand between you and another Christian. 
If there's anything you don't understand or somebody has offended you, pray, go to that person. Make a clean breast of it. Discuss it. Except the Lord tells you, no need. Because the Lord might tell you, that's his habit. That's his habit. Filet. Don't sit here, Lord. Because this is everybody in here. If the Lord says that, it's no longer a burden in your heart. It's no longer something, a grudge that you can so that you can flow in the love of Christ. Bow your heads, everybody. Let us pray. Things that help and things that hinder the anointing. Things that help. The Holy Spirit is the Holy Spirit. I commend you to God and the word of his grace. Came to pass as Jesus was baptized also. And praying, the heavens were open. The heavens were open. Company, the company you keep. Who are the closest people to you? Do you know how to flow in the love of Christ? Or you incubate locks, I mean you incubate grudges in your heart. If these things are there, they will hinder the anointing. Ask the Lord to help you. You'll be a clean vessel to the glory of God. You'll be a vessel of honor meet for the master's use. By the grace of God, your flow will not be clogged up. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Everlasting Father, I pray for your people. And I pray tonight, oh God, that a fresh anointing will come upon them. I pray my king in the name of Jesus that if anybody here is out of touch with the Holy Spirit I pray oh God that by the sharing tonight such a person will be cleansed and will become a vessel of honor. And Lord I pray that everyone here will flow and occupy in the office to which you have called them function in the ministry to which you have called them. That their place will not be vacant. And everybody here will occupy their places. Oh God with dignity and with honor. And everybody here will be fruitful. Jesus name I pray. Amen. I shall not be I shall not be moved just like the tree that's planted by the wall. I shall not.